Hello, my name is Adam. I am a MCAT specialist at um, Shamasian Academic Consulting. And today I'm gonna be walking you guys through a CARS passage from the MCAT. Um, so to start out before we kind of dive into this passage, the CARS section in the exam is the second section, right? So first we have chemistry and physics, then we have CARS, then we have our lunch break, biology, biochemistry, and then psychology and sociology. So this is following the chemistry and physics section. Now we have the CARS section. And what does this section look like? It's 90 minutes with nine passages, right? So that makes the timing strategy fairly simple there. If you aim for 10 minutes of passage, you should be able to give each passage equal time. Um, when you're practicing, you wanna aim for a little bit faster than 10 minutes, like maybe shoot for nine minutes or eight minutes so that in the actual pressure of the real event, you have a little extra time. Um, but yeah, you can shoot for 10 minutes. And if you're comfortably able to do every passage in about 10 minutes, um, you should be able to um, give appropriate um, effort towards each car's passage. So now yeah, let's dive into this actual passage. So there's a lot of different strategies and ultimately cars is a lot more dependent upon how you read and understand. So you need to figure that out for yourself, but we're going to start with the most basic strategy, which is just highlighting and highlighting kind of as a way of forming an outline as you highlight and then answering the questions following your highlighting and referring back to your highlighting as you need, but ideally not, not a ton. Um, and then another timing goal for this type of strategy, the highlighting strategy, is you wanna aim for about four minutes to read and highlight, and then you wanna answer the questions in the remaining six, right? So yeah, you kinda of wanna aim for that. Um, I'm obviously gonna do it a little bit slower today because I am going to be explaining why I'm highlighting what I'm highlighting and what I'm kind of thinking as I'm reading through the passage. Um, but that if I was doing this on my own or when you do this or a similar passage on your own, you wanna aim for four minutes reading and highlighting, six minutes. Again, adjust according to what works for you. And there's a lot of different types of strategies. This is just one. So yeah, let's dive in. Um, so let's start with just, yeah, let's start reading here. In the experience of the English speaking race, about once in every three generations, a social convulsion has occurred and probably such catastrophes must continue to occur in order that laws and institutions may be adapted to physical growth. Okay, so we're talking like a lot about, I don't know, growth and a different, I don't know, different things. I'm not exactly sure what this passage is about going to be talking about. So maybe I'll just highlight laws and institutions, kind of get us started here. What are we talking about here? Um, maybe social convulsion. That seems like that could be important. Let's just keep going here. Human society is a living organism working mechanically like any other organism. Okay, so we're talking about mechanicalness now. It has members, a circulation, a nervous system, and a sort of skin or envelope consisting of its laws or institutions. Okay, so this is kind of using that allegory of living organisms. I'm actually going to go back and do that. Um, and then again, where laws and institutions are that thing. So I don't necessarily need to highlight it again because I have it here, but social convulsion, laws, institutions, living organism, mechanically, right? We can go from there. This skin or envelope, however, does not expand automatically as it would had Providence intended humanity to be peaceful, but is only fitted to new conditions by those painful and conscious efforts, which we call revolutions. Okay, so interesting that they're mentioning one part of this organism called the skin or envelope. So we'll highlight that they call the skin the envelope. Um, and then a little bit about it here, right? So the thing that makes it expand are things like revolutions. So we'll highlight that. Usually these revolutions are warlike, but sometimes they're benign, as was the revolution over which General Washington, our first great progressive, presided. Okay, that's interesting. He calls them our first great progressive. And let's also highlight General Washington in case we have any questions about him. When the rotting confederation under his guidance was converted into a relatively excellent administrative system by the adoption of the constitution. Okay, so that was his revolution was confederation to constitution. Okay, so cool. I feel like we got a good gist of that first paragraph there. 
um, right? Again, you want to be able to do this a little bit more quickly than I did it there because I'm reading out loud and highlighting, but you can kind of see how I'm not highlighting entire sentences, nor am I highlighting like whole phrases. I'm just trying to capture the gist of what's going on. And I don't necessarily need to 100% understand right away at the beginning of a passage. I want to be able to, at the end of the passage, follow the arc of the entire passage and kind of be like, oh, what was the thread that connected everything rather than totally nailing it right away? Because that's how you could maybe slow yourself down to being like, I don't understand this paragraph. It doesn't make sense to me. Well, maybe read the next couple paragraphs and maybe they'll explain what was going on in that first paragraph and it can make a little bit more sense. So yeah, and I think it does make sense, but um, it, that's another way to implement this strategy. All right, we'll go on paragraph two here. Taken for all in all, I conceive General Washington to have been the greatest man of the 18th century. Okay, definitely going to highlight that because that is an extreme statement. In cars, we typically don't see extremes. And usually we rule those out of like, and when we get to the questions, we usually want to rule out extreme answers. But our exception to that is, of course, if the passage says something extreme, then it it is extreme, right? And then we can answer the questions based on that extreme. So highlighting that for being super relevant. But to me, his greatness chiefly consists in that balance of mind, which enabled him to recognize when an old order had passed away and to perceive how a new order could be best introduced, right? So we're kind of back to this idea from the first paragraph of revolutions and G General Washington's particular revolution of ending an old order and starting a new one, which was Confederation to Constitution. I think I might highlight that idea just so that I know that's what they said in this part of the paragraph. So I don't have to look at it again. So I'm going to say old order, um, new order introduced, right? Just to capture that idea again, even though it is a reiteration. Joseph's story was 10 years old in 1789 when the constitution was adopted. Okay. I know no better description of the interval just subsequent to the peace of 1783 than is contained in a few lines in his dissenting opinion in the Charles River Bridge case. Okay, so this is a case. Here's what this guy is saying. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm interested as to what this is going to add to things here. In order to entertain a just view of this subject, we must go back to that period of general bankruptcy and distress and difficulty in 1785. The Union of the United States was crumbling into ruins under the old confederation. Agriculture, manufacturers, and commerce were at their lowest ebb. There was infinite danger to all the states from local interests and jealousies and from the apparent impossibility of a much longer adherence to that shadow of a government, the Continental Congress. Okay, so he's being highly critical of the entire government here, but right, this is proceeding. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably highlight, right, he's talking about the Union failing under the confederation so maybe union crumbling confederation right he just goes on and lists more things about how it was failing um and then also this government this is the first time the government's actually mentioned not just the documents um washington was in his way a large capitalist but he was much more he was not only a wealthy planner but he was an engineer a traveler to an extent a manufacturer politician and a soldier. And he saw that as a conservative, he must be progressive and raise the law to a power high enough to constrain all these 13 refractory units. Okay. So this is kind of talking about what Washington was shooting for. I'm going to highlight the word Washington. So we know what this paragraph was about. Um, if we need to refer back, right. He was not only all these other things, but he was progressive and that he was trying to keep keep the country together right so i'm going to say uh let's let's say 13 refractory units progressive um to kind of keep the country together washington understood that peace does not consist in talking platitudes at conferences but in organizing a sovereignty strong enough to worse its sub subjects so i'm going to highlight that sovereignty strong enough so this is his goals for his his revolution that's kind of been referred to up until this point of the constitution the problem of constructing such a sovereignty was the problem which Washington solved, temporarily at least, without violence. Cool. Um, so Washington solved it. This is all just reiteration at the most part of this main idea. 
He prevailed not only because of an intelligence and elevation of character, which enabled him to comprehend and to persuade others that to attain a common end, all must make sacrifices, but also, so that's kind of, that's his point. Everybody must make sacrifices, but also because he was supported by a body of the most remarkable men whom America has ever produced. Okay, so he was supported. He didn't do it alone, supported by most remarkable men. Men who, though doubtless in a numerical minority, interesting. Okay, so there was a great men, but not most people weren't. Taking the country as a whole by sheer weight of ability and energy achieved their purpose. Okay, so they got it done. Yet even Washington and his adherents could not alter the limitations of the human mind, right? Of course, he could postpone, but he could not avert the impact of conflicting social forces. So he he did good, but he couldn't do it. So he could not avert conflicting social forces. In 1789, he compromised, but he did not determine the question of sovereignty. Interesting. So that, that's what he didn't do. He did not determine sovereignty. He eluded an impending conflict by introducing courts. Okay. So he, he just did courts. That was his way of avoiding it. As protect political arbitrators and the expedient worked more or less well until the tension reached a certain point. Okay. And so basically until it couldn't anymore and it probably started a war. We're going to assume that. Okay, cool. So again, I want to do that in about four minutes, but this is kind of what you want to shoot for with this type of highlighting strategy, getting kind of an outline the main gist of each paragraph and following the thread all the way through, which is kind of like in this main thread, Washington's super great. He did a revolution, which was going from confederation, which was really weak and bad for America. And then he introduced the constitution because he was great and he had great people around him. Kind of that, that kind of, that's the thread. So let's see on these questions now, how we can answer based on these highlights. So based on the number one here, based on the information provided in the passage, which of the following situations most closely resembles the envelope? Okay, right. So we remember envelope because we highlighted it, right? Because they they kind of highlighted it on their own by listing it as the only thing important from the living organism first paragraph. So the envelope was, right, they said it was the skin or the thing that didn't expand automatically, but did by revolutions. So... Let's see here. We got a water balloon expanding. It is filled with water. Eh, that's not, that's not, doesn't seem great, right? The, the envelope is not expanding automatically, which a water balloon would. The body of a motor vehicle getting flattened by a car compactor. That's kind of the opposite of what we're going for here. We're going for expansion. A family adding an extension to their house to accommodate more children. That seems fairly decent, right? Because we're wanting to expand out in to accommodate something which that's what we got going on here the chocolate covering of a dipped strawberry melting on it that's again the opposite right so b and d would be opposite answers a is kind of that's not true right that the, we're looking for something that's not automatic so c is going to be our best answer there all right number two here what is most likely to be true regarding to the shadow of the government referred to in the passage, right? We highlighted that as well, because that was the first time they talked about that Continental Congress. So what's most likely true of that? Okay, so this, remember, we're, we're either holding this in our brain, or we can refer back to our highlights to kind of figure out what's going on here. But right, this guy is quoting, he's talking, this, talking about how bad the country is under the Confederation. And he's talking about the Continental Congress being just basically a really weak government and putting us, putting the American people in trouble. So it's most likely to be true regarding them. We're, we're going to look for something along those lines. So a Continental Congress was not equipped to govern. That seems in line with what we're looking for, but we'll move on for now. We'll see if it still stands against the others. Continental Congress, though formidable, was not built to last. Right now, that's that's stupid. It was not formidable. Not the correct answer. Continental Congress was not responsible for the shortcomings of the early United States. Um, it's not solely responsible, but it seems like it is partially responsible. So the, that's not a good answer either. And then the Continental Congress was entirely responsible for the shortcoming. Again, that's also not true. It's not entirely responsible. Um, so I'd probably say A is our best answer there. Right? It's not equipped but not entirely responsible or not responsible, right? So C and D kind of along the same lines, but A is a better answer. Three, 
what did the passage suggest is the way in which Washington temporarily solved the problem of sovereignty? Okay, right. We remember this. We highlighted this. He temporarily solved, right? The Washington solved here. What paragraph one, two, three, four, five? That's paragraph five there. By, oh no, that's actually, we're going to go down to the next paragraph because it doesn't mention it. He solved, yada, 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 make sacrifices, but then he went down with courts, courts. Um, also, we could be looking for something uh, in this paragraph as well, which is he was a great man, but he was supported by remarkable men as well. Um, so A, he was a capitalist planner. No, that that was just listed at the beginning of this paragraph, right? Not, not great. Washington was surrounded by a body of the most remarkable men whom America has ever produced. Okay, that seems like a decent answer. Um, Washington, a strong leader, stifled the idea of adversaries to assert his dominance and establish sovereignty. No, he did the opposite of that, right? He persuaded others and he worked with them, compromised. So C is definitely wrong. And D, Washington, along with his wise counterparts, devised and facilitated the passage of the United States Constitution. That one just sticks out as soon as you read it. It captures both of the ideas in this paragraph of Washington being great and doing things and having remarkable men around him to do it. Um, so better than B. Um, because B is not mentioning the Washington idea. Also, um, it's, yeah, it, it is quoted that way, a body of the most remarkable men America has ever produced, but that's not, that's not really what he did, right? He, he did it along with them. So D is a better one. All right, we'll go on to four here. According to the passage, all the following are true, except, okay, when we see questions like this, all are true, except we should skip it. It's just a one strategy for these types of questions, but I think a really strong way to do this is to skip the question and do it last. It doesn't matter what order you do the questions in. Um, so we're going to skip this one and come back and do it last. Five, based on the information provided in the passage, which of the following situations most closely resembles the courts described by the author in paragraph six? Okay, they're even helping us, but we did know that he mentioned courts down here, right? These were a way to elude impending conflicts, right? So let's see what we got here. Declaration of war, that is opposite. Faltering ceasefire, that seems good, right? Because again, the courts didn't work, right? The tension reached a certain point and we went to war anyways. So faltering ceasefire, that's a decent answer. Let's see the other ones. Age old alliance between countries, right? That would probably be more formidable than just this kind of, he just threw the courts out there trying to see what they would do. A blockade against a foreign adversary, that that seems like that would be an act of war, probably. So A and D are probably acts of war out between B and C. Um, C seems like a kind of like a strong fix and B is more of a weak fix. That's what the courts were. They were a weak fix because eventually it did go to war anyways. Okay, so it's going to be B and then six here. Suppose that newly discovered historical records from 1785 written by George Washington described the need for a shift in the nation's laws and institutions. How would these documents be perceived by the author? I mean, he would love it, right? He, that's that's the whole point. He he loved George Washington and what he did, and he loved, yeah, he loved what he did. That's kind of the point. So let's find something that lines up with that. They would reinforce the author's opinion that George Washington is the greatest man of the 18th century. Oh, see, look, we got the extreme language there, greatest man, but... That's what the author said here, right, in paragraph two. So we wouldn't, a lot of times we would throw out A right away for saying greatest man and be an extreme answer, but not in this case because the author uses it. So A is seeming pretty good. We'll move on and look at the other ones. They would provide confirmation that George Washington was a politician. Yeah, but we, that's not what the passage was talking about in any way. So B is not a good answer. They would lend support to his argument that George Washington was surrounded by remarkable people. Um, this is not talking about other people. This is just talking about George Washington. So C's not in line with our question stem. And they would force the author to reconsider his stance that George Washington could not alter the limitations of the human mind. It's not really about that because he did alter the laws and institutions. He, he didn't alter the human mind, but that doesn't change because of that. So A is a good answer there. So we're going to finalize with A there. So yeah, that's that's a breakdown of a car's passage. Um, yeah, feel free to subscribe, get more of these videos. Um, and there should be a link also in the description to get a daily 
passage sent to your email inbox so you can practice a passage every day. Um, yeah, good luck and happy studying.